everyone, welcome back to Offstream Magazine, the podcast. I'm your host, Srinath Ramkumar. We have a very interesting guest for you today, and it's Dr. Tony Hyman from the Max Planck Institute of Molecular Cell Biology in Dresden. And uh, joining us for hosting today is Alison Lewis. Hey, Ali. Hello. So, Ali, how do you think the interview is going to go? Are you excited? I mean, Tony's a really great speaker. I have heard him give talks on a lot of different topics, you know, like what is a discovery? Um, I've already heard him talk about his uh, company, Dewpoint, which we're going to talk about today. And I mean, that's the real reason I wanted to have host him on this podcast is because I just think he has a lot of knowledge to share about his career and being a director starting Dewpoint. And he's really interesting to talk to. That sounds great. How did you become interested in interviewing Tony Hyman? Well, like I said, I'd, I've heard him give talks before and he's, he's an excellent speaker, but I've also heard other people give talks on, you know, starting up a, a biotech company and it's kind of like, oh, I had, I had this idea and so, and so I did it and that's really their job day to day. But what I think is interesting about, about Tony is he didn't just found this company, he still runs his lab in Dresden. And so I think he really offers this unique approach where he didn't go from postdoc to starting a company. He's really seen both sides of what it is in science to be an academic science, but then to also have this foot in the biotechnology world and to share that expertise with people who maybe it's not always, I think, especially this time in, in science, like, what you're going to do after are you going to be a pi an academic and get that funding or are there other things you should do and starting a, a biotech startup is one of them so it's more or less an extension on a person's career or like a personal career goal yeah i mean yeah it it's it's really like an exploration, you know, because you could become that academic scientist and really like get to the height of that become a director at a max Planck institute or, you know, Dewpoint has now been really successful. I saw a few that a few weeks ago, they announced a partnership with Merck for uh, studying HIV, which in the company has been around for about a year and a half now. It's the growth has been really impressive. And so I think being able to share that with uh, other young scientists, I, I hope will be interesting for them. Yeah, I mean, especially he also has like seen both, so the bad and the good from a scientific career and the uh, and the industry, right? So it would be great if he could um, explain these things maybe a bit in the interview today. Yeah, yeah, we can definitely ask him about that. And I do know from hearing him speak previously that he's uh, started and that he the Dewpoint isn't the first company he started that he actually started another one based on um rnai and that i know he said he learned a lot when was i was it successful uh, the first one i mean i think it's it's still up and running but i know he definitely said he wanted uh more investment the second time around like people willing to take more risks okay without any further ado let's get on with the discussion with dr tony hyman and see what he has to say to us I just stopped the intro there just to give a brief preface. We had a small echo while we were recording and I tried to reduce it as much as I could while we were editing the episode. But in case you guys have any disturbances because of this, we apologize in advance. And uh, with that, I take you back into the intro and I hope we don't have such problems in the future. Hello, Dr. Hyman. Welcome to this episode of Offspring Magazine, the podcast. We're very happy to have you here. Pleased to be here. So what made you want to become a scientist and what keeps you interested in science? I don't think anything made me want to become a scientist. I um, was one of those children who uh, never had much idea of what I wanted to do. And I just kept being a scientist because 
I was doing okay in exams in science. Um, and uh, I actually had a desire to open a bike shop when I left school. I didn't do very well in high school. Um, and I wasn't focused on academic career, but I wanted to start a bike shop um, with a friend of mine. Um, but we didn't have enough money to uh, start a bike shop. So I had to get a job in a lab in order to um, make enough money, um, working as a dishwasher, effectively making up media. Um, and um, But then I got into it in that job. I started helping the professors with their experiments. And I saw university was quite a lot of fun, a lot of parties and everything. And I thought, well, I'll go to university. And so in those days, it was much easier. I went to my supervisor and said, can I go to university? And he said, oh, yeah, I think that's a good idea. Um, and then that's how I ended up at university. And I also wasn't very focused at university um, until I had this great bit of luck, which is at the end of my second year, I went to um, an honors students program in Nutley, New Jersey. And my primary drive then was actually to spend a summer in Manhattan listening to jazz. Um, <laughs> and But when I got there, uh, I started working in the summer, and there was a guy called Jim Morgan who was looking after me, and he really was a great supervisor. And at the end of the summer, he sat me down and he said, uh, Tony, um, you know, I think you're pretty good at this science business, but you're a bit lazy. So when you get back, you've got to really get down. You've got to focus in on this, prop and you know, and then really work on your exams. And so, um, and then he said something else to me, which is, and I think a great thing to do for your PhD is to work on C. elegans um, <laughs> with, with, with this guy called John Sulston. Uh, I'd never heard of either C. elegans, of course, or John Sulston or the LMB. Um, and so, but I got back to England and then I, the first edition of Molecular Biology of Cell had just been published. And there was a chapter on C. elegans in it written by Judith Kimball. I read that. And then I rang up John Sulston um, on the telephone and I said, John Sulston, yes, I, I'm, I'd like to come and do a PhD with you. And he said, ah, hmm, uh, why do you want to work on C. elegans? But luckily I'd read the book and I said, the lineage is invariant. And he's like, oh, yeah, great, yeah, good. Well, why don't you come and have an interview and then we'll come and we'll talk about it. Um, and then I ended up meeting John White on that interview and the rest is history. Um, and what keeps me going in science, I think, is just I'm a very curious person. Well, I ended up enjoying, um, so I'm just a very curious person, and that's why I ended up enjoying science. Uh, science allows me to satisfy my curiosity every single day, and um, I want to know how things work. I always have done, and that's why I like to keep going in science. I think that that's really really incredible to hear because so many students i think or even scientists like don't feel like they necessarily belong in science or they they aren't smart enough or don't have the best grades so it's so interesting to hear that you also felt that way or maybe you say you didn't have the best grades so what what do you think has changed about the way science is done that maybe students wouldn't get the same chance now, or do you think they would? I think what's changed is that at each stage of my career, people took a look at me and said, he's got something interesting about him. And they were able to support me because the system wasn't so bureaucratic. So going to university, my supervisor sort of rang up the admissions department. They gave me a place. Uh, going to my PhD, I just gave John Salson a telephone call. Um, or who knows whether they would pick me out of a CV suite. Um, so, so I think that's what makes it more difficult. Um, that's good in a way because it's more meritocratic, right? You know, the way I went through it, you know, it's what you might call the old boys network in the old days. Um, mm -hmm. And so this is the advantage and disadvantage of all these different ways of thinking about admitting people. You know, the system needs a little bit of slack for individuals to pick people but I think, personally, that would be good, actually, for um, uh, inclusiveness, in my opinion. I actually think that the more rigorous you make the selection procedures, well, rigorous is the wrong word, the more bureaucratic you make the selection procedure, the harder it is to stress diversity. Well, I think there's definitely a lot that's shown that it's a bit self-fulfilling, that um, 
basically whoever makes the criteria is somehow picking who actually gets to join the club, as you say. And so I, I think it's, it, I agree with what you say that, um, you know, you need to really balance merit with, you know, drive and hard work and interest and curiosity because it's not just, you know, your grades on a CV. Yes, I think what people liked about me probably was I didn't get good grades, but I was always curious. I wanted to know what everyone was doing, how things worked. I wanted to talk to people. Uh, I was open, and that's probably something that they found interesting, which you can't get out of just looking at grades. And I guess that's something, I guess, that stayed with you through your postdoc and running a lab and I guess now running your company. Yes, I mean, I just... Um, continue to be fascinated by the way the world works. And how does that experience affect how you pick people for your lab? Well, I have a quite a simple procedure for picking people, which is I, I have a, um, you know, obviously you go through the initial CV discussions and check the reference letters um, and have a Skype call with them. But my thing has always been just to go out to dinner the night before the main interview with somebody because, you know, when you're um, running a lab, you have to talk to somebody all the time and you have to be able to talk to each other, right? The person you're bringing has to be comfortable talking to me and I have to be comfortable talking to them. And that's where discovery comes from, um, that constant interchange and discussion. And so I tend to take people that I have an easy discussion with. Um, and But there are different people. The good thing about that is some people like to talk to some people and other people like other people. So I try and make sure that it's people who I can have a good conversation with. It's definitely very personal. I think the people you work with is super important. And do you, do you find with, with Dewpoint and your company, you pick people the same way or is academic science versus um, biotechnology different? Well, you've got to remember that I don't really pick people for the company, right? As a consultant or a founder, you're not involved in operations. So apart from right at the beginning, um, some of the you know, team, I, I'm not involved in operations, so I don't pick people. I mean, it's a very different business because um, okay. in an academic lab, at least the way I run it, you pick people rather than projects. And the lab tends to go in the direction driven by the individuals that come in and their interests. Um, whereas in a company, it's not that way at all, right? It's looking for people um, to fulfill certain tasks normally, more so than academia. So okay. it's looking for certain skill sets um, as opposed to just um, necessary all-round um, people. Um, so people are equally yeah. smart in, in academia and companies, but... Uh, you know, it tends to be, oh, we need a protein chemist or we need someone who does screening or we need someone who knows computer science and you'll hire them. To do a very specific task, I guess. So I guess, could you tell us a bit about what Dewpoint is and what it does? I know it's interested in phase separation and biomolecular condensates, but on a very simple level, what does the company aim to do and why did you start it? Well, you know, there's a great unmet need for medicines. Um, and part of the problem is it's still a black box, right? It's a real um, hit or miss process looking for drugs. Uh, and no one knows how to do it repeatedly. Um, even the best people might have only bought a few drugs to the market in their whole career. Um, and so anything you can do to make that process faster and more efficient is going to be important. And biomolecular condensates is the idea that uh, many compartments form inside cells by physical chemical processes, such as phase separation. And we wanted, Dewpoint wanted to see how can we change drug discovery if we consider the cell as uh, a set of condensates. Another way to put it is that currently drug discovery is really what I call the science of dilute solution. You'll take a, maybe a few nanomolar protein and screen for drugs in vitro for that. But cells are three millimolar protein. Um, and 
if, and they form condensates, they can, proteins can be even more concentrated. And so the question is, um, how does that process affect drug discovery? For instance, if you make a drug and you add to a cell, does it actually get to the protein if it's in a condensate? Simple questions like that um, help you think differently about drug discovery. So by thinking of the cell as basically fundamentally being structured differently than maybe the way a lot of people were taught in their biology class, you're just hoping to discover a lot more about treating diseases is the goal. Yes, the goal. exactly. We're hoping to look at disease from a condensate viewpoint. So um, we've had some papers on, on that. In other words, you know, instead of the target being an individual protein, you could think of the target as the condensate what I call the community of molecules that like to hang out in one place. And so could you target the community and affect um, the activity of that community? Okay. And um, before we get too much more into it, could you describe what you mean by phase separation for people who have maybe never heard this term before? So phase separation um, is a term that is rather general. Um, in the sense that one of the ways we tend to think of phase separation is say, I mean, if you think of ice and water, that's a phase separation, right? When you form two different phases of matter. Now, um, or that's, um, and then, so we tend to use the term demixing of one liquid demixing from another liquid. And so we use this oil and vinegar um, example. You know, if you take oil and vinegar, you mix them up, and you let them set, then settle, then the oil and the vinegar will demix into two different um, um, regions because the oil molecules refer to the oil molecules and the vinegar molecules are the vinegar molecules. And that's a type of demixing. Um, and in the cytoplasm, we tend to think of um, proteins demixing from liquid cytoplasm to form a liquid compartment embedded in another liquid compartment. I mean, one way to think of a phase separation is something like all the kids are going to school with their parents, right? And you've got a, a mix phase. And suddenly, nine o'clock, the bell, and then the parents go to the cafe, and the kids go to the playground, right? And you separate into two phases, the parents' phase and the kids' phase. And that's because you change, effectively, an interaction parameter, right? At nine o'clock, you said the interaction parameter is the parents prefer to be the parents, and the kids should prefer to be the kids. And so that's a sort of, in a sense, sort of phase separation to two different parents' phase and a kid's phase. And I guess this is probably a big question now, is now that we know that these proteins can phase separate, is under what conditions and what prompts this? And I guess, how can you target them? Yeah. What, what prompts proteins to suddenly phase separate? I mean, for instance, we can do it by temperature. Uh, in, that's a classic parameter, but in cells, you phase separate even though you keep the same temperature. So you can change molecular interaction parameters, as an example. And the, I know it was over 10 years ago now that you published that original paper in Science where you described phase separation in the P granules. Did you know then that phase separation or biomolecular condensates had therapeutic potential? We had no idea. I mean, all we'd done is shown that in an obscure nematode um, that there were these P granules that formed by liquid light phase separation. But I'd had a very good bit of advice um, from Eric Carsendi, who I worked with in my first job, which is you can never tell how general anything is when you get started. Some things will be very specific to one particular organism or cell. Some things will be very general. So if you think when they discovered phosphorylation. They didn't know how general that was. They knew one protein had a phosphate that got taken on and put on, and then it turned out to be extremely general. Um, so at the beginning, you don't know. So you start off an observation, and then you start to go out and see how far it takes you. And I've done that many times in my career, but in this case, it just kept going and going and going, explaining more and more things. So initially for you, this was just a normal day in the lab. You thought you'd found something about P granules, and then you investigated it more, and it turned out to be more and more general. Or it was other labs were then picking it up and just and researching it as well. We were super excited at the beginning because we knew it was pretty cool, right? You know, the idea of demixing, 
We just didn't know how general it was, but we were very excited by the observation because we've been trying to understand the process of pea granule segregation for a long time. And here was a completely new way of thinking about it. Um, and really, it stayed very much in obscurity from 2009 till 2015. We worked for five years pretty much in the wilderness on that problem with no one getting any postdoc fellowships when we applied for it. Um, uh, and then um, 2015, it became clear that intrins intrinsically disordered proteins were key drivers of phase separation and that aberrant phase separation could lead to disease. So the three fields suddenly came together, the cell body of phase separation, the intrinsically disordered protein field, and the neurodegeneration field. And then it suddenly exploded in that, with that discovery. Um, so that was the driver. And what, what pushed you to keep going for those five years? You say you weren't getting postdoc fellowships, and I know funding in science is so challenging. How did you push through those five years? Well, I had the great bit of luck to be a Max Planck director, and I'm directly funded, so I didn't have to care what <laughs> other people thought. Um, and, you know, I thought it was really exciting and interesting. Um, and so I want to work on something. I'm just curious. And that's what curiosity is about. You just want to understand it. I mean, one of the ways I describe discovery to my students and postdocs is the following way. You're going down a busy road and there's like a bus stop at the end of the road. and You want to get there to go to work. And you're focused on that. And that's your main project. But every so often, the little doors will open up in the wall that you're next to. Right? You're walking down the road and there's a door. And you have to go through those doors. And you go through those doors and you see how long you spend. Depends on how much you get out of that particular door, um, what you find on the other side. And um, the, 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 what you learn in a career in science, fundamentally, in my opinion, is how often you spend going through those doors, how much time you spend in each door, and how much time you spend getting to the bus stop. And that's something that comes with a lot of experience of going through the doors over and over again, being frustrated, things work, things don't work, knowing when to pull back, knowing when to carry on. Um, in this case, we went through this door and we kept doing things and it got more and more interesting. You know, we showed that the nucleotis was liquid-like. Um, we were able to see nucleation of the cytoskeleton in the same way. And so we just got more and more excited. To me, what I find really interesting about this is as I said previously, it's a totally different way about thinking of the organization of a cell than what I would have been taught even in how recently I went to university. So was it immediately obvious to you something like phase separation? I know that you collaborated with, with physicists. How important was that collaboration in recognizing this new idea that maybe was a bit foreign to biology? Yeah, I mean, I think that was essential. It wasn't just that moment, but when we set up the Max Planck Institute originally, I mean, we pretty much, we rapidly focused in on the interaction between physics and biology as a key way for us to go forward. So we'd actually been working on physics and biology for quite a long time in many different ways. I'd done quite a few studies with Frank Ulicker and, and Stefan Grill and Joe Howard on issues of linking physics and biology in C. elegans. Um, so I was already sort of part of a, team and a thought process designed to think about how physics and biology could interact with each other. So we see this liquidy mixing and we think, wow, that's a beautiful bit of physics that's not been properly explored in the context of cells. Let's really have a look at it in more detail. But of course, it required the physicists I was working with, you know, Frank Ulicka, Cliff Brangvine, um, to really help to think it through. In other words, I think it was obvious that the demixing was beautiful when we saw it. It was just such an obvious, beautiful observation. But then taking it beyond that in terms of thinking about physical chemistry, of course, one has to work with people who understand physical chemistry. And I had a sort of lifelong learning then to really get into physical chemistry myself. And you said for you, it was really exciting right away, but do, were... Were other scientists on board with that excitement or did you really have to convince them? And was it challenging to communicate the novelty of this new idea? Yeah, I mean, I think I had spent quite a lot of time because we set up the Institute to work on physics and biology. My lab had been working on it for a long time. We had a number of different experiments where we combined physics and biology. So I had got quite used to how to 
talk about these sort of complex physical processes in simple terms, partly because I had to learn them myself each time and then present them. Um, and so I think, you know, that experience allowed me to go around the world and, and talk about this problem. Um, and I think some people are extremely skeptical. Some people still are skeptical. Other people think it's great. Um, but that's the kind of nature of scientific discovery, right? Yesterday's heresy becomes today's dogma. Um, and for a while, the concept, and it still is true that liquid phase separation and weak interactions is heresy to some people. Um, and that's fun. You know, I, 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 that's also what makes me get out of bed every day is, you know, my friends who challenge me on problems uh, is what takes you forward. I always tell my lab is that in discovery, you don't want only cheerleaders. You also got to have naysayers, people who push back. And they're the ones who really make you think, hmm, what do I need to do to really convince this person? And so you said a lot of scientists were skeptical, but I know in business, investors can be just as skeptical. So in this case, starting your company, who was, who did you have a harder time convincing, the scientists or the investors? Actually, no one had a hard time convincing. I was very impressed by the, the process the VCs go through because it turns out what they're doing is they're surveying the space all the time. That's about interesting academic ideas, right? And they organize retreats. They invite academics. They, they think about it. So the lead investors of this thing had already thought about phase separation because they organized. This is this guy, Polaris, who was a, somebody called Amir Nashat. And um, he'd, you know, he'd organize a Polaris, which is his venture capital company, a, a retreat. And people had said, look, this is a really up and coming, interesting issue, especially Phil Sharp. Um, and um, so then what happened was I was in uh, Boston and um, which I used to do every summer after going through Woods Hole, talking to Phil Sharp and Rick Young and, and Ibrahim Sisse and other people. And I'm having lunch afterwards with Rick Young and Ibrahim Sisse and saying, what about signing a company on face separation? He's like, how much time do you have? And well, I've got the eight o'clock flight this evening. And he said, okay. And he called up Amir and Amir's in the office within an hour. And then we talk and we get on well. Then he gets on a plane, comes to Germany, and then off they go. So in some way, does it feel like the business community came to you or not quite? Yeah, I think it is in a way, you know. I mean, I, 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 yeah, the business community have worked out that in a way I was, you know, that this would be something they wanted to do. And so the right opportunity came along and then they would sort of pick it up. Um, you know, I think actually one of the things I really learned about starting companies they're much more risk uh, acceptance than academia. Academia's got quite averse to risk. Um, you see that a lot when you're hiring group leaders or even postdocs. Oh, there's a risky project. doing that. And I always get very frustrated by that because the whole point of academia is to do risky projects. That's what we're in the business for, right? And by not hiring someone who's too risky, I never understand that argument. Um, and um, But it turns out that... The, the, for biotech is much has a great risk appetite for risk. You know they prepare to do things in a company that people are not prepared to do in academia necessarily. So do you think there's something I guess that academic funders can learn from the business community? I think um, yeah, a, a better risk assessment because of course VC is all about risk assessments. Money after all, it's their clients' money. They've got to do good risk assessment. But they do a lot of thinking about, you know, the potential risks um, and how to, how to go for it and how not to be conservative. Because obviously they know that to get a company that really makes a lot of money one day or is successful, you have to take a risk because you have to be out in front of everyone else. If you wait to follow, the, the chances are not so great. So that they have to weigh that up. And in academia, you know, I often think, you know, if you're not giving someone especially a tenured job, what's the problem with risk? Um, the best description I ever heard of how to pick somebody came from, um, I think, Anna Akhmanova about ERC grants, which is the following. You know, what you're trying to assess with a starting group there in academia is the following. In the days of navigation, right, you had to find somewhere you wanted to go. You had to plot the course and build the ship, right? And then you would get there and come back again. 
And if someone had proved they could do that, then they could get another ship and plot another course. And so all you're really asking is, in their postdoc, are you convinced that they set the goal, they plotted a course, they built the ship themselves, right? And that you can rely on them to do it again. And then ugh, the project is somewhat interesting, but, but this idea of um, worrying about the project too much, I never really understood. It was all about people, and someone should be able to come in as a scientist the next day and change the project on a dime because um, they found it so more interesting. That's what science is about. Um, so, and I think that's true in companies. You know, companies pivot very quickly when things are different. They have a, you know, they can rapidly get together and pivot and, and uh, change direction. And so you said the companies kind of had this idea about phase separation was maybe a big idea for therapeutics. Do you think if they hadn't already been interested that you would have started a company? Uh, yes, because I had, that's one of the reasons I asked Rick Young, because I had been interested in starting a company. I'd had a few sort of um, attempts to do one on Condensates and no one really picked it up. Um, people sort of picked it up, but but then um, so you know I really wanted to do it. I'd done one company previously, uh, Scenics Bioscience, which was a great company. It was based on the previous revolution of RNAi, um, but there I learned that if you don't have investors who are prepared to really invest in the idea, there's no point, right? You know, Scenics was always starved of funds, um, and so I said the next company I do is going to have major investment. It's going to be American money. So, so what do you mean it's going to be American money? <laughs> well, because Americans, you know, they just had a vision to do things big, right? You know, in Europe, it's always a problem getting enough money to get things going properly. And so every scientist knows how hard it is to raise money in Europe, you know, to, to do things. In America, it's the ability to put the money in, raise the talent, get the organization going. That's what I've been absolutely blown away by setting up Two Point. I mean, it's only been going, what is it, a year and a bit. But already, yeah, it's been I, really I, fast. 60 really people, fast. <laughs> you know, raised a whole bunch of money and lots of money, right? Two deals with pharma companies. I mean, it's just, it's just the, the breathtaking speed at which Yeah, I already get, saw get, that last, the, what was it, two weeks ago that there's a deal with Merck now. Yeah, you know, exactly, yeah. Which is incredible for a year and a half. I agree. For, and so, you know, and so um, that's much harder in Europe. And... Um, and that's why American, but America dominates the biotech scene because they have the local talent, management talent, the money, and the drive to do it. So a lot of the companies based out of Boston, but we also have a Dresden site. So yeah. Yes. What made you think it was important to have the two sites? Well, I think you know the investors understood initially that a huge amount of condensate expertise was in Dresden. They wanted to get a condensate, so they had to have the expertise. And so I think about four or five people in my lab went off to run it, right? Um, and uh, they were essential at the beginning for providing the condensate expertise. Uh, but then Boston was able to, at the beginning, to supply the sort of executives and the pharma people who knew how to make drugs. So the idea was a kind of marriage made in heaven of the young people who knew about this new field and the executives who, who knew how to, um, how to uh, do drug discovery. And so what was the more challenging part of getting set up, or maybe it was equally challenging, but, you know, securing the money and convincing people to invest not just a bit of money, but enough that it could really stand a chance or to assemble this team? Um, the thing is, nothing was difficult. You know, it, it's like, um, you know, it's easy to assemble the people because it's a great idea and people are excited. It was easy to raise the money because it's a great idea, so people were excited. So everybody was just excited. I mean, I think that's one of the things I've kind of learned in life is ideas have their time, you know, and it's just about that right moment. Um, if you go too early, it won't work if you go too late. So, you know, this is an idea that just had its time. It was just at the right moment um, where people are excited because a lot of people like to go into the, wil you know, the wilderness and do new things. And so they were excited by this idea. Um, so I think, yeah, that, and that's been my kind of lesson in life, you know, is that um, 
it's sometimes you have a great idea and you do it, you publish it, and it just bombs, right? It doesn't go anywhere. No one takes any notice um, quite often. Uh, but sometimes you do something and it just seems to be just the right time. People pick up on it and, and go for it. And the power of an idea, that's what circulates extremely quickly in society. And, and this is what you had here that you just, pe- people were excited about it. Yeah, people were excited about it. Both the scientists in Dresden and the investors in America were all excited about it. That's that's really nice to hear because I think in in science you hear a lot about the the struggle for funding, the skepticism, which I think is the skepticism is important, you know, to do good science, but sometimes it's just nice to have this curiosity and let's just come together and do it. So it's nice to have these stories. Well, I'm privileged to be a Max Planck director. I mean, you know, that I, you know, I, I feel consistently privileged and thankful in my life that at the age of 36, I was given this chance to be funded for the rest of my life, right? And I think that I've helped the Max Planck Society, you know, in the sense that I've given back. Um, but they prepared to commit to me as a young person quite a lot of money. and. Um, that's what made my life basically, and and you know the deal was for that I had to go to Dresden, and help set up a new Max Planck Institute, and but I was young enough at the time to welcome the challenge of going to a place in the middle of nowhere at that time, and and build a biotech camp, help build a biotech campus um, with my colleagues at the time, you know Ivan Baines, Kai Siemens, and Marina Zeria, and Ilan Hutner. And Joe Howard came later, and we all went out there and just decided to build this institute. Um, and did you find this experience that you had, you know, starting an institute valuable for starting a company? Were a lot of the skills translational? Well, I think what's important in life is to, this old phrase, know yourself, right? You've got to know what you're good at, what you're not good at, right? And that's a lot of self-reflection required. And you want to do things that play to your skills, right? And what I found out building Institute, you know, I'm very good at getting people together. You know, I'm very good at motivating people, getting ideas, helping people see ideas, um, being positive. Um, and, and it turned out, and I also found I'm quite good at technically, at, you know, broad range of technical skills. Um, so that showed me that, you know, which is what you have to do to start a company, that I would then be good at that particular process. You know, I have other weaknesses. You know, I tend to have difficult concentrating for a long time. And, uh, and you know, that means I have to be careful not to do things that require too much, um, you know, deep, deep, deep concentration. And did you always know that about yourself? Or I guess it was a bit of a process of discovery to really learn what you were good at and what you needed to improve on and how long did it take you to learn that yeah i think it was a process of uh discovery because up to the came to start my group in heidelberg i was well known and i thought of myself as just being extremely good technically at getting very difficult experiments to work and that's what people knew me for as well so it was a self-discovery process actually when i started my own group to realize that i liked Run, you know, working with lots of people, giving people ideas, um, supporting people. That's something I found out that I enjoyed a lot. Um, And uh, so that was a very big self discovery process um, that I continued when I was given the chance to help start the Smash Punk Institute. And and that's some advice I give to all young people is, you know, to, to try and work out what you're good at, you know, it's like just because your neighbor's giving 80 talks a year and runs a lab of 20 people doesn't mean you should be doing that, right? Because maybe they're not good at that. Maybe you're better at running a smaller lab and getting more deeply into a particular problem. And so you have to adjust your own and not be jealous of other people because they're different, but to celebrate the diversity of the way people are in science. Yeah, I I think there's definitely not enough focus on that in in science, that it's okay to run a smaller lab, that it's okay to maybe not want to even as a student be a career PI scientist. Sometimes it feels like the only option, which is why we wanted to do this podcast, is to really explore the things you can do in science that aren't a traditional academic. 
Yeah, I, I think it's it's fine to be any way you want to be. I mean, I think that's you know that's what we should be celebrating in life and also in science, right? It's fine to have a huge lab as long as you treat people properly in that lab and they're successful, right? It's not fine to have a big lab if it's just throwing people on the slag heap, right? In one person after another, if they're successful, they go on. If they don't, I, I mean, I, I don't feel that is personally um, a viable way to run a lab. But it's okay to run a huge lab if everyone coming out of your lab is getting jobs and you're publishing papers. That's okay. It means you're good at it. It's also fine to run a small lab if people are coming out of your lab getting jobs and you're publishing papers too. And fundamentally, there's not a lot of difference. Because what does success really mean in science? As long as you have a job and you have funding, right? I mean, success means publishing papers, right? And there's no one sitting there measuring the number of papers you publish as an ultimate goal. When you retire, no one says in the retirement ceremony, an XX published 300 papers, but YY mm -hmm. published 20 papers. No, they talk about what did you discover? I think as a young student, you just, you sometimes don't necessarily see that. It feels all about metrics and numbers and you, you sometimes just lose the joy of curiosity and discovery that you talk about. Well, I think one thing to remember is the following is that although it looms large in your mind now as a student, the postdoc is a tiny part of a career in science, right? And so, you know, there are difficulties in getting to run a group. You have to prove yourself in certain ways. That is true. Um, but the rewards are great when you get there, which is you then spend the rest of your life following your nose with a team of people that want to follow you. Um, so, um, because, you know, it's like all selection processes, right? I mean, society and you know, the taxpayers about invest a lot of money in you as a group leader, right? I mean, it's, uh, you know, if you hire a nine-year group leader, I don't know what the total investment must be, five million or something. You know, it's quite serious sums of money. So there has to be some selection process. And no selection process is completely fair, right? Some people are good at taking exams. Some people aren't. Why is it fair to make it exams? But we accept that, right? Mm -hmm. You know, you have to publish a paper in a good journal. That's, you know, there are other ways to do it, but it's, you know, but that's a, as good a way as any, in my opinion. Um, and the good thing is that most good scientists that I know of, they really want to be a scientist and they really focus, end up publishing a, a good paper. That's my, and you know. So if, if you love it, you'll dedicate yourself to it and it won't feel, I guess, if you do a job you love, you won't work a day in your life. That kind of holds true. true. Well, I think, you know, it's like mostly what goes, I mean, so you have a number of shots on goal, right? You know, you can do PhD, of course, you have to publish a paper. It doesn't necessarily have to be a super duper paper because lots of people are looking for good postdocs. Then you have another chance of postdoc and you might have a couple of chances there. Um, I think that um, the thing to remember is that, how the best to put that, um, what normally goes wrong is people lose heart because science is such a difficult business, you know, and you're thrown out of undergraduate where you've really been told what to do. And suddenly, you, no one can tell you what to do because no one can tell you how to discover anything, right? There are certain ways to do it, but you're right in the most difficult process a society can possibly put you in. And some people lose heart because it's just too difficult. It's shocking how much time you spend failing as a scientist and nothing prepares you for that. Yeah, for that. exactly. Fail, fail, fail. No <laughs> one can tell you what to do. Um, you know, you have to formulate ideas, put yourself to the test. Um, I often think that because I didn't do well in school, I, 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 know I had never had pretensions to be successful. You know, I wasn't trying to hold on to some great reputation at high school or university. So that left me always with a feeling of, um, that's okay. You know, you just enjoy yourself. And, and that was a key part of my emotional character that made me um, successful. I, I, yeah, I, I think that's, it, it, it's, it's the just keeping going and thinking and staying calm and businesslike which are the crucial things to success in science. Um, taking the next logical step based on the data. And I guess this is kind of the same in, in business, as you, as you said, the 
that at Dewpoint, you know, you still look for talented people, or I guess not you specifically, I didn't know that you said that there's a CEO and that you're not necessarily involved in the day to day of the company. Um, yeah, I mean, I think um, companies have a different problem because they have money for a short period of time. You know, as an okay. academic scientist, you actually have quite a long time to prove it. If you go all the way through your PhD and your postdoc, you're at least 10 years to prove yourself. So you've given quite a long time, um, but companies don't have that time, two, three years, and then, and then that's it, if you haven't oh, sh- wow. shown how to go ahead. So it's a very, very different business. And that's why it's such a different culture, right, is that academia, you know, you want to be able to say to someone, okay, go and spend months on that problem. We'll talk again in a couple of months. Just think it through, see where your nose takes you. Um, so would you say as a, as a biotech company, it's a lot more about volume. You're exploring a lot of ideas, you know, throwing a lot of things at the wall and seeing what sticks? Yeah, yeah that's a lot of that, but a huge amount of asking questions, you know, is this right? You know, what did this data show us? Um, is this the right direction? Do we have to pivot? You know, you don't have that much time. So, you know, in, in academia, one of the biggest things in companies in academia is that, you know, I have 24 people working for me and I'm the only manager, right? But in a company, that, that's not true at all, right? For every person doing bench work, there's probably one manager who's not doing bench work, oh, wow. maybe two, two to one or something. You know, I, you know, I don't quite know what the ratio is, but huge amount more management. <coughs> and that management okay. is involved a lot in strategic decisions about whether it's the right experiment to do. And I, I guess myself, and I think maybe a lot of students would think this too, that when you start a biotech company that you're the CEO and you're running it and, you know, it's it's like having a lab, but you're a company now. And this doesn't seem to be the case or this was just something you chose to do. Well, there are different plays, right? You can start off small companies. That would be also the more European model. You might become maybe the CSO at the beginning, and you develop the idea slowly. You take not too much venture capital, so you own most of the company, you get grants, you build up the idea slowly, and then you eventually try and go for it. And that's a successful model. This is a different play viewpoint, right? It's taking an awful lot of money from venture capitalists, setting up a a professional team, and really going for it. With the kind of capital that academia can't hope to get together, So it's an enormous amount more money that academia will bring to the problem. And I know we mentioned earlier the partnership with Merck, but there's also been Bayer, I saw, is partnering with the company. It seems like the growth in the past year and a half has been incredible. Extraordinary, yes. How how was this accomplished? Um, You know, I think through a lot of people with an awful lot of experience in what it takes to... um, talk to industry and convince them that we got some use, you know, good ways of helping them think about their problems. Um, you know, industry is always trying to explore different ways, pharma, to get at their problem because they have actually quite a lot of money in R&D and, they, and these drugs, you know, make huge amounts of money if they're blockbusters. So they're trying to explore all the time to do it. And unlike previously where all the R&D was done inside of pharma, pharma does a huge amount of collaboration with biotech. So they'll have a lot of different biotech. Um, to keep going. And so um, luckily, Dewpoint had some very experienced people right from the beginning from industry who could help us navigate those directions. And I suppose at this point, it's helpful that the data seems to really be supporting the idea. I've seen papers now about the role of biomolecular condensates being involved in things like Alzheimer's and other aging diseases. I saw a paper recently about cancer therapeutics. And so it really does seem to be quite general, like you were saying. Yeah, I mean, I think it's it's clearly something that's important enough that you have to think about the consequences of anything you're working on. You know, it, it's it's like, and, and because one thing, one way to think about it is, is like, It's like thinking about a village, right? And if you only work on how two molecules interact with each other, you're saying, I can understand the sociology of a village simply by looking at pairwise interactions with people. But we know that the sociology of a village is an emergent property that comes out of all the interactions. 
And that's what you, we're saying, basically, is that it's great to work on intermolecular interactions. I mean, driving force molecular mechanism. But there's another layer of complexity on top of it, organizational, which emerges from the way these interactions happen. It gives you new properties that didn't come out of molecular interactions. And once you accept that, then you have to look at that for everywhere. And so I suppose, like, with your lab and collaborators' labs and DewPoint, you really have the opportunity to take a multi-pronged approach. You know, I know that you do basic science, really trying to understand the mechanisms molecularly that drive phase separation. And other labs, I know Simone Alberti is interested in understanding the aging processes. And then you have DewPoint that's working on the therapeutics. And so how do these collaborators, it's a number of people that have to come together. How do you all organize that? You know, I think that is the experience you gain from working over many decades with many people. You know, it's like always checking in with all your collaborators to see that everybody's on the same page. You know, one thing that tends to go wrong is that people have different viewpoints of what they're doing. It's not they disagree, but they have different viewpoints, misunderstandings. So you're constantly trying to check in and see that everybody's on the same wavelength, everybody understands what's happening and why, and why you're collaborating and be open. You know, if you're collaborating with somebody, you're worried about a conflict, then you talk to that person. And I learned that a lot of that in America is very good at that, you know, worry about your conflicts, right? And just dealing with them and talking to people and say, listen, I have this conflict, this is my worry, um, you know, and then, and then talking it through. And so, you know, to have a large collaborative network like that, you have to like people, fundamentally to be like talking to people. And what would you, I guess, say to a young student who thinks they want to do this or at different stages of the career, I guess it's very different, who, you know, thought, I want to be a biotech CEO. Do you have any advice? I would say it's a great career. You know, you, you, it's, it's so different academia because you can fail and start a game. So you join a biotech company, you have an idea, it fails. Next biotech company starts up. Then they hire people to come back based on your skill set. Um, so, in other words, it's it's a it's a it's a sort of very different, but in some ways more um, secure existence in that sense, right? You know, the academic existence is much more fragile, right? Because failure is difficult in academia, um, and um, so in many ways, biotech is a great business, right? To to get into if if you're good at what you do and you like working with people and you like working in teams, um, it's, it's probably better than academia, in my opinion, at this point. Um, there's more risk taken. There's more effort put into real teamwork. Um, there's a lot of thought given into diversity and such mm -hmm. relations. Um, whereas academia tends to stress still the individual, which it probably has to, because discovery comes out a lot from individual ideas. And so if you were a postdoc now, do you think you'd take a different road seeing what biotech is like? I think I'm probably not because I happen to like academia and I suit academia quite well. You know, I, I, I'm a risk taker. You know, I like to gamble on things and, and I'm curious about the way the world works and I need to follow my curiosity. You know, so... And, and, and I don't, I'm not very, I'm, I'm a difficult person to organize. So I, I, I have trouble fitting into a hierarchical structure because I just, I'm just difficult to organize, basically. You know, I tend to go off and do my own thing. And, 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 and so I wouldn't necessarily work well. So actually, academia has been great. But I'm also sure I'd have been great in, in, um, in, uh, in biotech. Well, not great. I mean, I've sort of had a good time in biotech. Um, but it just has happened over the last years that, my particular personality and, and basic research need to fit each other well. And so what keeps you inspired in science? Like what are you most excited looking forward to say the next five or 10 years in science? You, it's difficult to answer that question because I think a lifetime of direct funding actually um, means that, you don't tend, I, I personally don't tend to think in long-term goals. You know, I don't have to write grants with sort of five-year goals and that sort of thing. So I tend to come in every day and think, oh, what should we do today? 
you know, or tomorrow. And let's explore that idea. Okay, it doesn't work. Let's do the next thing. Um, so, you know, I'm very, very excited about what we've done with Condensates and things have started going, you know, and it's been great to see that some ideas that we had early on were um, have changed the way people think about cell biology. That's a great feeling. Um, I'm very excited to start a new point. I hope it makes important inroads into medicine. Um, but, you know, potentially some student will come into my office tomorrow with a, another big discovery, just like when Cliff showed me the movies of pea granules in 2009. I'll just think, oh, let's do something different. Which I think is, for me, one of the most exciting things about being a scientist is you think you know what you're going to do and then you come in and you do that experiment and you realize that's actually not what I'm going to do <laughs> exactly at all. <laughs> it's going to be something yeah, totally exactly. different. Yeah. yeah. And it's what I said at the beginning and what you're learning is you've got to have a goal. All right. Otherwise you just flail around, right? It's got to be a goal. as like the bus stop, but you've got to go through enough little doors to do something a bit different. And you've got to spend enough time chopping back the undergrowth through those doors to see what's there. And that's what you ask yourself all the time is, am I spending enough time going through those little doors? Because if I don't go through any of them, I'll never make any major discoveries. And I guess if you go through too many. <laughs> you won't do anything in life either. Yeah, exactly. You see, you, and we all know people, right? We know people who spend too much time who are busy on a certain goal. You know, they're not really, and we all know people who spend far much time, they get excited on the next idea and they never get anything done. So we all know who, you know, as we're watching that training, so we all know how we're trying to steer that sort of, um, that sort of boat, you know. And there's times when you should do one thing and times you're doing another, right? Sometimes you have to ignore the doors and just go to the bus stop, You've got to get stuff done. Um, and other times you've got a bit of time in your hands so you can go through a few doors. And how much of this did you learn on your own? And how much do you attribute to mentorship you had? I mean, without mentors, I certainly wouldn't be anywhere I am today, right? I mean, I've had outstanding mentors throughout my career, and, and, and I'm where I am because of my mentors. Um, but it's like I always say to my students is that what you're trying to do with each particular mentor is you're trying to pick the best parts and throw in the bad parts. And then in, in, you're trying to create a version of a scientist, which is the best part of your mentors. And that's why you can create a unique version of yourself, because you're the only person normally who had those set of mentors. Um, very few people have had exactly the same mentors through their career. Um, and so, um, and that's what I always, you know, look at the best and worst of me, take the good parts, throw away the bad parts, and put that together and try and build it any way to do it. So, you know, so you come out with a unique um, perspective. You know, I, I had a very lucky break at doing my PhD with John White, who really taught me that biology, you know, just how things work, biology is really interesting. But he built the first commercial confocal microscope. Um, mm -hmm. And so I learned you also have to make tools to do that, right? Then I went to see Tim Richardson, and, and he taught me, you know, you can't learn anything in science unless you're quantitative, right? And, and you know, rigorously quantitative. Um, and um, and then I went to EMBL, Kai Siemens, and I saw so how open Kai Siemens was to developing people, that he saw that the way ahead was to work in a team of people, a team of group leaders, a team of postdocs, you know, and that was how you made progress by this, you know, being generous with credit, being generous with ideas. Um, and I guess just put those together to come up with these kind of ideas that I talk to you about about how things work and so throughout your career you know you see these mentors who you learn from but I think now as a director at a Max Planck Institute you're kind of the mentor you're at the very top so who do you learn from now like do you still feel like you have mentors and you're still really growing in this process of self-discovery like or is it more you feel like you know enough now about yourself that you can kind of be self-taught, really? I mean, I think once you have that idea, that few points of the world, it's time to retire, right? I, I would say that you should probably stop and stop spending government money. I mean, um, <laughs> you know, I, 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 
For instance, I learned a lot from Amir Nashat, who was the CEO of Viewpoint, got Viewpoint about how to organize people, ideas, money. You know, I'm constantly learning by talking to him. Um, you know, and, and Rick Young, my co-founder, has been very helpful for me thinking about, how, you know, the way the world works. Um, so it's, it's a constant process of learning from other people. Um, I also learn a lot from reading. I recommend that. Um, you know, from reading widely, um, not in my field, but reading, you know, uh, like Seneca, this Latin author made a bigger fit impression on me on the shortness of life um these things also reading widely is very 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 helpful for helping your you know viewpoint on life and how to help people and it sounds like not just academic articles no no not academic articles that, that... which is definitely what people think of in science when you say you need to read more like i need to read more nature articles or no, you probably have to read fewer nature articles. I mean, the literature rocks your mind in the end. You know, it's good to do some reading, but most of you don't want to be too bothered because the great thing is the student is you're unencumbered by people's bias. That's when you can make discoveries because you're not biased by people's previous discoveries. And as we get older, we get we have more and more trouble stepping outside the, the box. And you have to keep training yourself to do that, step outside the box. I mean, it's something, a process that I spend a lot of time on you know, I frustrate my colleagues, my director colleagues, because I'm constantly saying, oh, why don't we do something different? You know, and mm -hmm. Ivan just said to me, he said, you're like a friend of mine who, when you're driving, um, he can't keep driving straight. He always has to turn left or right, you know, even though the right way. <laughs> and, but I think that's because I'm all the time trying to step outside the box uh, and force myself to step away from what I'm doing and look from outside and see um, um you know are there other ways to see this problem and i suppose coming back to in the beginning you talked about diversity being important in science that you know you probably need at least even within a lab people who follow that road who are very methodical and organized and detail oriented and then the people who are a little bit more in their own world and willing to take more risks and you build that community. Yeah. And as a lab, I think you have to convince the lab that, you know, everybody's equally important. You know, that's the crucial thing to running a lab that everyone feels, I mean, you're no one's perfect like a parent, but you are striving if you can to make people feel, you know, equally important. The ones who got the cell papers and the ones who may be struggling, right? Everyone's as important as everyone else um, in the lab. And so in your lab, right now you're pretty focused on phase separation. But I know in, you've also worked on the spindle and other types of organization of the cell. And so how do you divide your time between those different research areas? Well, as I said, I tend to have a bit of gambling mentality, and you know, I, I decide to switch. Um, and there'll come a moment when I work in the field where I think, oh, I just not much more to add here. You know, I, I remember when we were doing RNA interference, and we were very early on RNA interference. I had a postdoc at the time, Pierre Gunsi, who's gone to run his own lab, and you know, and he really got RNA interference going. And we did the first genome-wide RNA screens, and we had a whole, you know treasure chest of genes that hadn't been worked on. And we were publishing great papers, you know, with the following title, Gene X is required for process Y. And they were getting the high profile mm -hmm. journals, right? But then I just suddenly decided, I've got nothing more to add here. There's nothing doing anymore, right? And I have to do something different. Um, so I think I tend to do that, basically, not hang on. And that's the great thing about having wonderful trainees as they go off to labs and run, do their own product and do a better job than you. So that gives you the freedom to move on. And one of the great challenges running a lab is that people move on, they take the products with them, and every time they leave, you have to think of something new. And that's a great challenge. And so you've had a busy career as a scientist. What do you think your life would have been like if you'd been a bicycle mechanic? Um, you know, I think I've always been really, really driven. And, you know, one of the features that people always said to me early on is I have more energy than everyone else. 
So I probably just would have built a big fleet of bike shops, you know, you know, and, and got in new ideas, new bikes, new this, new that. I wouldn't have been satisfied with the status quo. Um, and I, I think I would have, you know, tried to be successful in whatever I did. I mean, because it says, I said, as I said about um, my not doing well exams, I'm not an academic in the classic sense, right? Suzanne was academic in the really classic sense, right? Extremely interested in many aspects of science and read widely. That's not me. And not just science. Yeah, not just science, exactly, yeah. Classics. Classics, says everything, exactly. <laughs> uh, you know, she was a great student. She was, you know, and, and uh, um, so I don't think I need academia to be happy. I just have to be doing something I'm curious about and try and sort it out. And that could be science, I think, or it could also have been, you know, making really cool bike shops. And I think that's a nice reminder for a lot of scientists who can relate is find something that you are curious about and it doesn't have to be what you necessarily did yesterday. Absolutely. You know, it's staying curious and staying, you know, staying curious and staying grateful, right, um, that we are funded by the government to do what we want. And even yeah, those of us, right yeah, a, yeah, we've seen in the COVID-19, really to be uh, yeah, how lucky we are to get the chance to, to satisfy our curiosity every day. You know, and even for those of us who, after a postdoc, go on and do something else, what a gift in life that you had 10 years of government funding to satisfy your curiosity every day. And, and I think, um, yeah, exactly. I think we all should be, we have to be extremely grateful. As you say, the current COVID pandemic has shown just how grateful we should be, how lucky we are. Yeah. You know. All right. Thank you sure, very much good. for yeah. your time, yeah. Tony. Not at all. And maybe we'll hear from you again on the podcast. It sounds like you have a lot of expertise to share. Always a pleasure to talk to you, Alison. Thank you very much. So that was a very good, interesting discussion with uh, Tony Hyman, wasn't it, Tad? Yeah, it's really interesting to hear someone who's had a very long career. I mean, he was saying he got started as a group lead or as a director of a Max Planck Institute at 36. So he's had a very long and accomplished career. Yeah. And also the way he's uh, founded not one, but two companies which are focusing on different aspects of uh, what his research has led him towards and uh, somehow trying to bring them to the production scale as well as to find therapeutics from these. So I kind of feel he, he's got a very illustrious career. He seems very eccentric to me, to be honest. <laughs> the way he spoke and the, the way he thinks about being a bike mechanic as soon as he graduates from high school. I mean, that was a, seemed like a very eccentric person's uh, viewpoint on the world. Yeah, I I think it's just like he said, like he he's curious about about things and so the bike mechanic is is an outlet for that. Except eccentric maybe. He uh, I've seen his uh, two little whippets around the institute following him around, which is incredibly adorable. And so may, maybe that eccentric <laughs> is the right word. <laughs> okay. So with that we've come to the end of uh, this discussion with Dr. Tony Hyman. If you'd like us to feature anyone interesting for you from perhaps a different field, we've realized we've been covering people in the biomedical section for a long time. So if you're interested to cover anyone in the chemistry, physics, technology, or even the humanities section, please feel free to let us know and send us an email at offspring.podcasts at phdnet.mpg.de. And with that, it's uh, Ali signing off. Bye, everyone. Until next time. And a bye-bye from me as well. Bye. Offspring Magazine, the podcast, is brought to you by the Max Planck PhD Net and the Science Communication Working Group known as Offspring Magazine. We have new members to welcome to our team in Adrian Lahoya and Sandra Fendel, who will be joining us with production as well as hosting from the next year onwards. Oxford Magazine, the podcast, is currently hosted by Shaina Tramkumar, Nicola Herman, and Alison Lewis. The intro outro music was composed by Shaina Tramkumar, and the pre-intro jingle composed by Gustavo Carrizzo. Please feel free to get in touch with us with any feedback, comments, or suggestions at offspring.podcasts at phdnet.mpg.de. With that, I wish you a great week ahead. Stay safe, stay healthy, and see you all next week. Until then, bye-bye.